Now, for those of you who know me, this might be coming as a surprise. What is this? I'm not starting my lecture with my customary map. No, I'm not. But don't you worry, I will be bringing in a map soon enough. First, how about some review? Some review for those who've taken Art 200 with me or who've had the pleasure of seeing my Byzantine and Gothic lectures and some new information to prepare those who have not studied the medieval period for the study of the pre-Renaissance, which in a few significant ways is essentially a continuation of what is going on from the late Middle Ages. It's so much of a continuation that some people say that the pre-Renaissance and the late Middle Ages are the same thing. I disagree with that with every fiber of my being. Artistically and contextually, these are two different and distinct periods. And that is why I did not include the pre-Renaissance in Art 200, and I am putting it with Art 201. So let's take a trip down memory lane, back to grumpy, angry Jesus, for those of you who took the first survey course, to the Byzantine period, which began in the sixth century and in varying forms, lasted all the way until the 15th century. This period is characterized by art that is highly religious in nature, as you can see here. And this religious imagery, Christian to be more specific, is often openly combined with political imagery. The early and middle phases of the Byzantine period of art produced art that was very characteristic, had very um, characteristic stylistic features that are rather routinely applied. And this is great news for us because it allows for this style to be identified, I would say, quite easily. So here are some of the, the features. So first of all, we have a simple composition. Now this comes in two parts, okay? First of all, you have a simple composition that's limited with its figures, one, maybe two. And the other thing is we have a simple background. Now we can kind of parse this out a little bit. We can and we should be more specific in reference to this simple background. So the simple background, first of all, nothing but blank space, right? So we don't see trees, we don't see buildings, anything like that. And the point of this is to really encourage um, people to, to focus. And this is also why we see such limited figures depicted as well. The focus is on this, um, you know, single or maybe two religious figures as points of devotion and contemplation. The artist doesn't want us wandering in the background, looking at other things that are tangential. We're not to be distracted, essentially. So anyways, with this simple background, it's not just simply a plain background, but notice as we see here that this background is gold, okay? Gold. Now the gold means a couple things, okay? First of all, when you think of gold, what do you think of? You probably think of wealth, right? Now would it make sense to look at a religious image that's encouraging the viewer to do whatever you can to get rich, right? That typically is not part of religious ideology. So what would the gold then represent? Spiritual wealth, right? So the gold represents spiritual wealth. The gold also represents an abstract spiritual space. Jesus is hanging out somewhere, you know, up in the, the cosmos, up in heaven, that kind of thing. He's not here on this earthly realm, okay? Gold is very, very, very prevalent in Byzantine art, so much so that this is kind of a shortcut or a little bit of a cheat. If at any point you see gold, say Byzantine, and you'll be either talking about the Byzantine style or a style influenced by the Byzantine style. Now in terms of these figures, okay, these one or two figures, couple things, they're very simple in their representation. They tend to be frontal, facing towards the front, and they tend to be stiff. This frontality, this stiffness, isn't really the way that we naturally position our bodies. And so it kind of reads as an image that almost is abstract. It's very simplified. There's a lack of naturalism that we tend to see in Byzantine period artwork. Now, when we're talking about this abstraction, we can take it one step further. Another thing that we tend to see with Byzantine art is an elongation of form. Now, where we see this often is in the bridges of the nose, which we see right here, 
And we also commonly see it in the hands, right? These like creepy elongated finger situations, right? That's typically where we're seeing the elongation. So again, put this together, stiff, frontal, elongated, and it comes out looking very abstract. And then finally, we have a relative lack of emotion, right? Yeah, Jesus is grumpy and angry, but um, you know, we're not really seeing emotional expressions beyond that. And we're certainly not typically seeing emotional expressions of any kind in other religious figures represented in Byzantine art. So Byzantine, that's the first important preceding style for us to study before we start the pre-Renaissance. The other one is the Gothic period. The Gothic period. So the Byzantine period is considered to be the very outset of what we call the Middle Ages or the medieval period. And then we've got the Gothic period, which is a later period. And this is seen to come at the very end of the Middle Ages. So Byzantine at the very beginning, Gothic at the very end. Now, this is also important because like the Byzantine period, it, this period, the Gothic period, also provides us with insight into what we've got going on during the pre-Renaissance. Now, concrete dates are difficult to pin down for this style, but scholars generally agree that the Gothic period began in 1140, and that one actually, that's not hard. We totally know 1140. We've got it down to the region. We've got it down to the church, all of that. So 1140, definitely. Where it's kind of sketchy is when it ends. And we're thinking around the year 1400. And the reason why we're not exactly sure when this period ends is because the Gothic period had an international appeal. So it began and ended in different regions of Europe during different times. Now, like the Byzantine style, the Gothic style is also very religious. In fact, the production of Christian art almost completely dominates art production for the entire medieval period, which roughly spans about 1,000 years. And that's from the end of the Roman Empire, the fall of Rome, around the year 500 CE, all the way until the beginning of the Renaissance. Um, even though Christian art, you know, the dominant starts to wane in the Renaissance, we will continue to see a strong presence of Christian religious art, at least through the 17th century. Now, the Gothic style is divided into two components. The early Gothic style, which is represented in the uh, sculptures on the left, and then we've got the later high Gothic style, which are the sculptures on the right. And they're really different. You can see why art historians have made this division between early and high. Major um, stylistic changes have occurred and these are clearly vis visible even if you don't know anything at all about the Gothic style. Now I'll start with the early, the early example, right? Our early Gothic sculptures um, and this example is significant artistically. We're going to talk about this, but it's also important in terms of patronage. Okay, patronage. And this is something you definitely want to put in your notes. Patronage. This is going to be important um, for the, the earliest part of our class. Very important in our overall consideration of context, at least into the pre-modern period. Now with patronage, what we're referring to is who commissioned the work of art. When we know who paid for the work of art, it can help us to understand why the artwork was created. And it can help us to understand things like what it was that the artwork was intended to achieve or what message hopefully was going to be communicated. Now for the Old Testament kings and queens, these um, are Old Testament kings and queens that decorated decorated the sides of each doorway of the Chartres Cathedral, and this is located in France. They are the royal ancestors of Jesus, who is the historical figure of the Christian religion. And that's the person who's responsible for establishing the religion and initially spreading its ideas. We call these jam figures, J-A-M-B, jam figures. And this spelling will show up again later on in lecture. So these jam figures, what's important about them are they are dressed in contemporary 12th century clothing. 
So when the people who saw these sculptures looked at them, they knew they were biblical kings and queens, so they made that association. But because these people were wearing the clothes of the current people of France, it encouraged the viewer to also think of these in terms of the current kings and queens of France. And that idea of sort of linking biblical uh, king and queenship to secular, that's definitely a point of political propaganda, a way to sort of further promote the power of the French monarchy. And this was something that we also see in the Byzantine period, although we didn't look at an example in this lecture, of mixing church and state to perpetuate political power. Now, in terms of style, take a look at the sculptures. We can see they're stiff and they're frontal, right? Facing the front, they're unmoving. That stiffness, that frontality, that actually is a carryover from that earlier Byzantine approach. They face to the front, as I said, and what's happening is because of that, they face out, they stare blankly, there's no emotion, there's no interaction with the viewer or with one another. And again, not very realistic. And again, we have that elongation that contributes to that lack of naturalism. Now, the High Gothic period, this theme visitation, okay, very clear steps are being made towards a more realistic depiction of human form. This journey towards realism really starts to happen in the pre-Renaissance. So we're seeing like the kernels, the seeds being planted in the High Gothic period. It begins to grow and develop in the pre-Renaissance, becomes fully realized in or starts to become fully realized, I would say, in the early Renaissance, and then reaches full effect, naturalism to the maximum, in the High Renaissance, uh, which will be addressed in later lectures. So we see here that there is more of this conscious effort on the part of the sculptor to capture this sense of three-dimensionality, right? These sort of fully rounded forms, rather than these like almost plank-like figures attached to a column. So by doing that, um, we get this sense of like implied movement and um, it gives us a sense that the figures sort of lean into space. They turn, they face each other, they are interacting perhaps, and that's providing that sense of psychology. Uh, perhaps even you could say a very restrained aspect of emotion. That idea of psychology, right, is really important because we're going to see um, kind of starting in the, the pre-Renaissance, but definitely in the, the Renaissance proper, uh, this focus on individuality, individual experience, and a lot of that comes from focusing on individual psychology. So that's pretty major. The other thing that's major is look at the bodies. Okay, first of all, look at the drapery. Um, you can see here that the drapery is rather stylized, and what that means is it's kind of reduced down to these sort of perfect linear patterns, which really are not representative of the natural way that cloth appears. Cloth wrinkles and folds and it bunches over the body to sort of indicate the volume of the form underneath, and that's certainly happening right in here, right? Much more of a realistic treatment of the cloth. And then, oh my gosh, what is this? a poking forward knee, a contrapposto stance, which we have not seen contrapposto stance since antiquity, since before the beginning of the medieval period, right, 1,000 years earlier, um, that kind of relaxed suggestion of form, and this is also indicative of things to come. The contrapposto stance, the poking forward knee, this is a hallmark of classical sculpture, and we're gonna see that classical influence is a really important facet of the Renaissance style. So these two styles, the Byzantine, the Gothic style, this is review or a new introduction. These are two important preceding medieval styles that definitely are going to inform what artists are working with, with the pre-Renaissance. And with that sort of context, we have a map. We have a map of Europe around the year 1400. So let's talk about what's going on in Europe during this time. Now, during this time, Christianity continues to play a huge part in the lives of the Europeans. This is actually true in the 1300s, true in the 1400s. However, we are also seeing that intellectual and artistic discovery are on the rise as well. And this becomes fully realized in the Renaissance, which is known as Europe's cultural rebirth. 
And this is Europe wide. It's not just Italy. And that's usually the location that people tend to think of when we think of the Renaissance. It went beyond simply Italy. Fundamental to the development of the Italian Renaissance was humanism. And this set of ideas gained greater prominence during the 14th century in Europe. And it became a central component of much of Italian art and culture in the 15th and 16th centuries. What is humanism? It's a lot of things. First of all, a code of civil conduct, a theory of education, and it also was a scholarly discipline. It's like a precursor to today what is our humanities discipline. Now, as the name suggests, humanism is most concerned with human values. Now, humanism does not just like come onto the scene during this time. Humanism actually has a very old history. These ideas date all the way back to classical culture. And when we say classical culture, what that designation refers to is um, ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Now, not only is it classical culture, but, and this is important, it is classical secular culture. And that word secular means non-religious, okay? This explains a couple things explains one, why we see such a strong classical influence in the art and architecture coming from this time, which not so much yet in the pre-Renaissance, but certainly when we get to the Renaissance. It also is gonna explain why we see a rise in secular subject matter, why there's no longer a complete domination of religious art. Now, humanism <clears throat> is also promoting the idea of the individual asking questions like, how does the individual understand the world around him? How can he or she contribute to the community in which they live? So it's kind of a shifting away from the collective, the group, which the collective in the medieval period was the church, and moving towards the single individual. And that's really a major paradigm shift if you think about it. Now, let's take a look at what this translates to artistically uh, with these gorgeous paintings that we see here. Um, and these paintings are two out of many paintings that are coming from the Book of Hours that belonged to the Duke of Berry. Now, in the Middle Ages, painting was seen primarily in the form of manuscript painting, where they would take these books and they would richly paint them with beautiful illustrations to accompany the texts. And most often these would be religious texts, like the Bible for Christianity or the Quran if we're talking about Islam, which is also a prominent religion in the medieval period. Do you remember what these were called? These books that were painted with these beautiful illustrations? If you said illuminated manuscript, you would be correct. Now, it's during the pre-Renaissance that we see the true maturation of this art form. Um, obviously, these paintings are gorgeous. Um, and among the early 15th century artists who are credited with this furthering of manuscript illumination, some of the best of the best were the three Limburg brothers who painted the paintings that we see here. What they're best known for is the elaborately illustrated Book of Hours of the Duke of Berry, um, and he, Duke of Berry was kind of a big deal. He was the brother of King Charles V of France. The Book of Hours was used to cite prayers at certain hours of the day so that you were literally praying around the clock. The calendar pictures, such as the one we see here, are probably the most famous in the history of manuscript illumination. They represent the 12 months in terms of the associated seasonal tasks, and they alternate between scenes of nobility and peasantry. And so I chose um, a couple examples to illustrate this. The seasonal tasks is in terms of like in January, you celebrate the new year, in October, you harvest, and then we've got the rich people and we've got the poor people, which I don't think it's too hard to tell who is who uh, in these two images. Now, the Book of Hours had multiple functions. Okay, It was a religious book, which I already talked about, prayers to pray during certain times of the day. Also, though, it had a political function because it captured the power of the Duke and his relationship to the peasants, particularly through this alternating back and forth between images of the nobility, images of the peasantry. And then we also have a calendrical function, calendar. 
In addition to the depiction of the seasonal tasks, above each picture, seen here as well as here, is a lunette, half moon shape, depicting the chariot of the sun as it makes its yearly cycle through the 12 months, and also depicted is the affiliated astrological phenomenon. Now in January, we've got this depiction of a New Year's banquet, very lavish at the royal court. Can anyone guess who is the Duke? Any wild guesses? Uh, it's pretty clear once you look at it. Here he is, right in here, the Duke of Berry. And how can we tell this? Um, aside from compositional principles, such as uh, implied line, uh, we do have some hierarchical scale going on. Um, I like the idea that he is coincidentally, and you know I'm making the little uh, marks with my hands, coincidence, coincidentally positioned in front of this fire screen that, I don't know, looks like a giant halo, right? So we've got that. Um, can we also talk about this gorgeous brocade gown that he's wearing? Um, if that doesn't express wealth and therefore power, I don't know what would. And I don't know, let's talk about this random phallic symbol that's thrown in here as well, right? We know phallic symbols also are really effective uh, ways to communicate masculine notions of power. Very appropriate because political power tends to be uh, conceptualized as masculine. Now, for those of you who are new to my art history classes, maybe don't know what this means, phallic symbol, Phallic symbol, P-H-A-L-L-I-C, is basically any sort of symbol that is in reference to an erect penis. They're everywhere. You can't unsee this stuff. Now that you know what this is, everywhere you look, you're going to see phallic symbols. And once you do that, you truly have become a student of mine. All right, let's talk about October. So in contrast, we've got October. It's focusing on the peasantry. And we've got people who are working in front of the Louvre, the structure right in here. The Louvre was the residence of the king at this time. Today, not a palace. Instead, it's a super legit museum. Now, the peasants, if you, if you look at them, they don't appear disgruntled as they go about their work. They just do so matter-of-factly. And this image was a way to flatter the Duke, to show that he was compassionate because he didn't overwork his peasants. They didn't mind the, their tasks. He was such a great um, leader that they're totally fine working for his benefit and profit while he goes hunting and hosts huge New Year's banquets in amazing gowns. Now, we can also see this subtle or maybe not so subtle reference to the Duke's political power with the palace of his brother that kind of looms over these peasants, sort of watching over them. Now, from a stylistic standpoint, what we can see is this growing amount of naturalism that, again, is going to become characteristic of Renaissance works. Close observation of the natural world in this attempt to convincingly represent three-dimensional space. We've got the careful architectural detail with which the Louvre is rendered. And this is achieved, these details, a sense of naturalism through this crisp, tight brushwork. And this is going to be important because this is going to become an important characteristic of northern, and we do need to make that distinction, northern Renaissance painting. All right, this is gorgeous, but let's take a look at something else. Let's take a look at some sculptures. So the Book of Hours that we just looked at, this is an example of art that's combining politics and religion, and actually another example that we see here. So the patron of this uh, amazing collection of statues is Philip the Bold, and he was the Duke of Burgundy. He was the brother of the Duke of Berry, Sky in the previous image, and also Charles V, the King of France. The, like the Duke of Berry, the Duke of Burgundy, Philip the Bold, was no dum-dum. He understood well the power that art could have. He understood it had an aesthetic value. It appealed to people visually and emotionally, and it could communicate religious beliefs. And helpfully, it could also communicate the power of the Duke as well. So part of the Duke's commitment to the arts was to build a giant monastery the Chartreuse de Champmont. This was intended to communicate the Duke's power and the salvation that the generosity of the Duke could provide, right? He's so concerned about his people. 
he builds them a church that they can worship in to make sure that their souls get to go to the afterlife. How generous, how benevolent. The, uh, the generosity of this man clearly knows no bounds, right? So also what he intended for this church was to also be the site for the family tombs. And that was very typical to put tombs of significant people in significant churches. Now, many ways we have here what is similar to the typical Gothic portal, this entryway to the church. So we've got our jam figures, right? And we saw a couple of examples of jam figures earlier on when we were looking at the Old Testament kings and queens from the jam figures, the portal at uh, the Chartres Cathedral, right? Jam figures, sculptures on either side of the, the door. The central sculpture that we see here is called the Trumeau. There's a spelling for it up in here. Now we've got a reducing down of ornamentation. For any of you who studied the Gothic period, we know that Gothic structures, particularly high Gothic, in terms of ornamentation, they get crazy, right? This is really simple compared to what could happen. And that simplicity is on purpose because the um, artist, totally legit sculptor Klaus Luter, he wanted to make sure that the focus remains on these figures because it's a really important part of the patronage, why exactly this, uh, these sculptures were created. So what's significant are, is right in here. These figures, Duke of, of Burgundy, Philip the Bold, here's his wife, Margaret of Flanders. Now let's think about this. Could this by any chance be advantageous politically to show them in this position? Well, first of all, it indicates how pious they are. They're on their knees. Their hands are clasped. This is a way to placate people. People see how religious they are and they think, oh my gosh, these people are religious. These people are moral. I'm just going to go ahead and trust them because they obviously are going to have everybody's interest in, at heart. They're obviously going to make all their decisions from a really sound Christian perspective. That's a lot of assumptions happening right there. Now, also, they're depicted life-size, right? So that kind of really helps to reinforce the presence of these, these figures in this space. And look where they're located. They are the ones that are located closest to Mary and baby Jesus, right? They are even closer to Mary and baby Jesus than the saints on either side. St. John, St. Catherine, who are the patron saints of these patrons. Okay, so they are even enjoying a closer proximity, a closer relationship to significant religious figures than even saints. That's kind of a, a pretty bold claim. But of course, Philip the Bold is going to make that claim. Now, what's also significant and part of this propaganda is that these sculptures are located in the entryway. So this is a highly visible space within the church. This cannot be missed. You have to walk by these as you go through the door. And the function of this is to remind people who it is that's responsible for their salvation by providing this beautiful church. And again, show their power by intimating this very close relationship. They know Jesus and Mary personally, obviously, is what they're trying to say. Now at this point, the inclusion of patrons in this fashion is very rare. In the past, what we typically see with portals, with the jam figures, is that it would be various saints. So to put the patrons there again, very bold. Now I find this to be particularly significant because in my mind, this is speaking to things to come. As you will see, this idea of including the patron to suggest power and or religiosity is going to become increasingly common. Now let's move on. We're going to move on to Italy, pre-Renaissance Italy. Now we see at this point in Italian art that a style is still very much entrenched in the Middle Ages, particularly the Byzantine period. This is why I had this review for you at the beginning of this lecture. Now it's important to note this because this Byzantine influence is a very prominent feature of Italian art. So much so that we refer to Italian art produced during this time as either Italo-Byzantine or Neo-Byzantine, which means New Byzantine. Now, maybe this is a good opportunity to test yourself. Ask yourself, this image on the left, what qualities does this piece share with the Byzantine piece on the right? 
how is it different? Pause the video, see if you can figure this out. So hopefully you did that. So let's talk about this. Okay, where the Byzantine influence remains. We've got formality of the figures, okay? They're stiff, they're frontal. The fact that the figures are depicted very simply, almost abstractly, right? We have that lack of, of naturalism with, again, long nose. Look at these creepy long fingers, right? Oof, making me uncomfortable, right? That lack of naturalism. Uh, for those of you who took Art 200, remember this? Man baby, homunculus Jesus. Okay, that's coming back. Also, for those of you from Art 200, throne or seat of wisdom. Uh, that theme was institutionalized in Christian art during the Byzantine period. Throne or seat of wisdom is this idea that Mary acts as the little, literal throne upon which Jesus sits. And then, of course, we have the lack of emotion. And don't forget our little shortcut, heavy use of gold, right? So now let's talk about how it's different. One of the things we see is that we have the artists using the gold strategically, using the gold and its reflective qualities to enhance the folds and thus the realistic appearance of the drapery. We also see that there are a lot more figures, much more complex composition. And the complex composition is used in a very simple way to suggest a three-dimensional space using the techniques of overlap and vertical placement. And vertical placement is essentially um, placing things higher up vertically in the composition to suggest that there is a spatial recession. Now, what's significant, okay, is also the artist. This is Cimabui who made this piece, and he's considered to be the father of Italian pre-Renaissance painting. Now, he enjoys this accolade because he had two very important students who perpetuated his ideas. One of the students pretty much carried out exactly what the teacher, Shimabui, was doing, while the other one was a complete and total boss trailblazer who did his own thing and pretty much made the most contemporary cutting-edge paintings in all of the pre-Renaissance. So let's start with the student who is faithful to the style of his teacher, and that would be Duccio. Duccio went on to head the Sienese School of Painting, which was essentially the artists who were based in and around the Italian city of Siena. Now, I don't mean to sound like I'm hating on Duccio because I'm totally not, uh, but I just really don't feel like I have a lot to say right now. Pretty much the notes you just took in your previous slide apply to what we see here. We have a replication of the Byzantine style. All the things we talked about, right? But the departure really is seen in the more complex composition. Um, maybe even a bit more naturalistic than uh, Chimabui's piece, because at least with Duccio's, we have um, what seems to be, if you kind of do a comparison, these all look the same. Here we've got more of that concentration on individuality, which is kind of a sort of precursor um, or a, a sort of indication of an early influence of humanism, uh, the poses seem more varied, they seem more relaxed. Yeah, that's what I have to say about that. Um, let's take a look at another example of Duccio's work, but let's take a look at it alongside Chimabui's other student, who was responsible for establishing the Florentine School of Pre-Renaissance Italian Painting. That would be the artist based in and around the Italian city of Siena. Who might this person be? That's right, Giotto. Giotto. So we've got this comparison here of two similar subjects, the kiss of Judas, betrayal of Judas. And I kind of almost feel bad for Duccio, and again, not trying to hate, uh, for putting his work next to Giotto's here because there's really no comparison. Um, we can see, even if you don't know anything about Giotto, which that's going to change in a moment, 
Um, he doesn't just simply replicate the style of his teacher or even the general style of the pre-Renaissance Italo-Byzantine approach. He is going out on his own, working in a style that's all his own with dramatic and dynamic compositions never been seen before in all of the history of art. He is creating art that is blowing people's minds and it's gonna make him incredibly influential to subsequent artists. Giotto's name is going to come up over and over and over again in this class. Giotto is so influential, he pretty much ushers in the entire Renaissance. That's right, one man on his lone shoulders ushering in the entire rebirth of art. So let's all take a moment and send up into the afterlife a gesture of thanks to this genius, to this visionary for this feat of the ages, Giotto. Now let's take a compare. Take a look here and see what exactly it is that Giotto's doing that's moving past what Duccio and Cimabui were doing, okay? Now, first of all, let's talk about the gold, okay? Here we've got G uh, Giotto using blue, and you might think, okay, whatever. No, not whatever. This is huge because what happened is, is with this use of plain background gold, we basically see a lack of nature being depicted in art for 1,000 years. Now, I'm going to give credit to Duccio. He throws a few trees in there. That's kind of a big deal, right? But Giotto goes one step further and uses a blue to show sky. We haven't seen blue sky in a thousand years. So he's bringing nature back to art and that is huge, right? Now the other thing, Duccio again, he goes beyond his teacher Cimabui by showing these kind of like somewhat different um, positions of the, the figures and both uh, Duccio and Giotto, they are using figures in profile. Okay, and that's very rare for the time. They're moving away from the idea of the frontal presentation of the form. But Giotto has been credited, and rightly so, with really developing its usage in art. And this was really startling people because they hadn't really seen anything other than that typical stiff frontal form. Look at this stuff, right? These people are not stiff. They're not frontal. We're seeing people in all these different uh, views. Or even this, this one's huge, showing a guy from behind we don't see this type of representation of figures again until like early 1900s, late 1800s French Impressionist painting. This is showing that he's like 500 years ahead of its time. It's crazy uh, how amazing Giotto is. Now, he uses these varying positions to instill this sense of individuality, which we know is this nod to, to humanism, which will get picked up further in the in the renaissance let's talk about that idea of a lack of emotion okay that idea of like figures not looking at each other not interacting here we really see this development of psychology and art now where you can see it is in the kiss so duccio does this kind of like weird awkward sort of like half kiss situation which that's fine whatever but oh my gosh look at this right here you got judas puckering up right big puffy face. He's almost shown a sort of ape-like. And Giotto did that on purpose because he really wanted to emphasize the treachery of this moment as Judas comes in to give a kiss to indicate to the Roman soldiers who it is they should capture. So he's puckering up and Jesus is like looking straight at him, right? Calling him out. This is such a powerful interaction here. And Judas puts his arms around him, envelops him in this coat here. And that uh, yellow is meant to be a symbol of, uh, of uh, treachery as well, and also corruption and, and cowardice. So um, amazing paintings, right? And I want to talk more about Giotto uh, because he is so significant to the history of art, probably one of the most important artists. I'd rank him probably number two. So here it is. Let's talk about the arena, also known as the Scrovegni Chapel. This is where the most famous of Giotto's paintings are located, and this chapel is located in the city of Padua in Italy. Now, it's named after its patron Scrovegni, Enrico Scrovegni, but it's referred to casually as the Arena Chapel because directly next to it were the ruins of a first century Roman amphitheater, right? The center of a Roman amphitheater is called the Arena. 
So Enrico Scrivegni, he was a very rich man and he made, his father actually was the one that made the money and he made his money uh, through usury. And this is when you give out loans and you have really high interest rates. And this is seen as kind of messed up because it's only people who are like really desperate for money that are going to take loans with such bad terms. So essentially, you know, you're getting rich off of the most vulnerable section of, of society. And that really just didn't feel very Christian. Certainly it contradicted Christian notions of charity. And in fact, um, Scrivegni's father was so bad, he was such a um, notorious user that Dante actually singled him out in his descriptions of hell when he was writing the Inferno. So Enrico Scrivegni in, you know, inherits all this money that was uh, you know, sort of gained from these really sort of problematic, sketchy practices. And he's feeling really guilty about this. He's like living the high life. And basically that fortune was built on the backs of exploiting poor people. So what he wanted to do is he wanted to atone for the sins of his father. Um, but I think he also is like kind of wanting to still convey like, hey, I'm also powerful and wealthy. And, you know, he could have like a, conveyed by, I don't know, like giving away his fortune to four people, but he didn't decide to go that route. Instead, he built a fancy church for him to uh, worship in. So he has this chapel built. And in many ways, this continues uh, with that kind of um, patronage practice uh, that we've been looking at at this lecture, right? And something that we're going to want to think about. He's kind of trying to do the same things that the Dukes of Berry and Burgundy were trying to do. Now, what we're looking at is we're looking at a view of the interior. I have some, um, you know, here it is blank. To give you a sense of scale, here's some people. There's me right here loving every second. You get 15 brief minutes in this amazing church, right? So you can get a sense of how, how large this is. This here, the Last Judgment, is on the other side of this wall here. So I also put that in there to try to give you a total view of the, the interior of this incredible church. Now you can see that the church is, um, the interior consists of large flat areas of uninterrupted surface. The Gothic period, again, for those who've studied it, crazy, right? You've got pillars, rib bolts, um, compound piers, you know, all these things. And this was really innovative because it was very simple. And it was so simple that it functioned really well to highlight the paintings. And what some art historians think, and I tend to agree, is actually it supports this argument that Giotto, he not only painted the paintings, but he also um, designed the chapel as well and designed it in a way to showcase these paintings. Uh, Giotto was also an incredible architect. And in fact, he designed the bell tower of the um, cathedral in, in Florence. And a little sad story for you guys, um, the, the sort of like, Thing that people said was, oh, the ugliest man in Italy built the most beautiful bell tower in Italy. Google him. He was not that ugly. I don't appreciate people saying that about Giotto. Anyhow, so what Giotto was asked by his patron Scrovegni was to paint a cycle of images that depict Christian redemption, right? Which you can see where this is going, right? He is sorry that he is living a ridiculously lavish lifestyle redemption, right? He wants to still go to heaven regardless. The overall theme of the images is salvation. Um, and together we've got 38 framed, sort of this like faux architectural uh, painting in here, 38 framed narrative paintings that exist on three levels, which we can see here. And then we've got a uh, painted marble down here in the bottom. Now, by having this faux architecture painted in, this is allowing to make each individual scene distinct. Keep this in your radar, and here's why. This is not going to be the only time in this class where we see someone uh, painting faux architecture as a means to make distinct um, multiple images within a single large-scale painting. We will see that this will be an influence by the incredible Michelangelo when we get to the Sistine Chapel. Now, let's take a look at some details. <clears throat> so first of all, let's talk about the Last Judgment, right? Which was in the back. Let me go back for a minute just to show you. This right in here. Okay, let's take a look at a detail. 
Okay, here we go right here, the last judgment. So we've got this composition, we've got it divided up. We have a kind of different sort of Jesus. We've got our uh, grumpy, angry Jesus being re resurrected from the the uh, Byzantine period. And the reason why I'm saying different is because grumpy, angry Jesus is replaced by handsome, nice guy Jesus in the um, Gothic period. So Giotto kind of like goes back to that grumpy, angry Jesus. He's come back for the last judgment where he's deciding who goes to heaven, who is going to hell. These people here are the people that are uh, saved. These are the people that are damned to hell. And here's it's like kind of visible, and I'm sorry about that. A lot of details. Um, this is uh, a detail of the, the hell area of uh, the Last Judgment. So a couple things. Okay, first of all, let's talk about this guy right here. You want to know who this is? This is Scrivegni. Okay, he actually is included within the artwork, just like the Duke of Berry, just like the Duke of Burgundy. Here he is on his knees presenting up to the Virgin Mary and her entourage, the arena chapel, right? And basically he's like saying, here I am, I'm atoning for my sins, okay? And um, it's kind of interesting because, let me see, go back for a second. This right in here, this is actually Scrivegni's tomb. He's buried in this, or entombed in this, this uh, chapel. And what's funny is there's kind of like this inscription of like, oh, hey, um, Here's this, this chapel for you to say, I'm sorry, it worked. See you in heaven. So he's pretty sure that this is all he needs to do is basically just build, oops, build this, um, this chapel. So there's that. And then over here, we've got the people that, um, oh, wait, one more thing. Sorry about uh, Scribegni. He's wearing purple, right? Giotto's really into iconography, which I appreciate because iconography is interesting. Purple robe represents penitence being sorry, right? Now, the other thing that's important is the hell, which is why I, I brought this in, okay? So one of the things you see here is you see people hanging, right? Now, these people hanging, one of the people that's hanging here is a depiction of Judas. Now, this is very, very, very rare. There's only one other known example in the entire history of art showing Judas in hell, and it's this like image of Judas like tucked away. He's in a corner. You can barely see him. Where here Judas is front and center. Now Judas factors in quite prominently with um, the uh, imagery in uh, in this uh, chapel because Judas he was a, he also was a user. He made money by giving these sort of um, exploitative loans, and so you know. Judas is in there to kind of acknowledge what it is that Scrivegni is trying to atone for. The other person that's super focused on in this uh, chapel, the Virgin Mary. And the Virgin Mary, because she's seen as that idea of forgiveness, right, of the redemption. So he's appealing to her uh, in these hopes that, that he will go to heaven. So I just want to just show you some examples. I don't even really want to go fully in depth because these images speak for themselves. Um, can we just talk about how gorgeous this is? This is such a beautiful painting, okay? Now, let's talk about how we have Giotto kind of moving on beyond Cimabue and Duccio, right? Instead of our plain, nondescript, gold background of an abstract spiritual place, blue for the sky. We've got trees for nature. We have a subtle angling of a building to suggest that there's some receding into space, right? Now we have naturalism. Like, so you can see like every little hair on Jesus's face, all of these different depictions of unique individualized facial features. Differing expressions of emotion. And this is nothing compared to what we'll see with emotion coming from Giotto. The idea is naturalism, right? More and more of this um, intent to show the world around as realistically as possible. Keep in mind, he's the first one to really be doing this since antiquity. And this is the cornerstone of the Renaissance. This is why I keep saying this guy is ushering in the Renaissance. We also have naturalism shown in the way he's depicting people, okay? Couple things. 
First of all, he crops the picture plane. What that means is that it extends off into space and that creates a more dynamic, a more dramatic composition. If we go back, right, this is super dramatic, this like fight, all this stuff happening. You even have someone kind of like extending off the corner and this guy sort of like pulling on his robe, right? Who is this guy? What's happening? By cropping the picture plane, instead of just having everyone sort of like carefully framed inside, shows the action spills off, right, beyond what this limited view provides. Again, this idea of cropping the picture plane, super ahead of its time. We're not going to start regularly seeing this until about 500 years later in painting. Now, um, another thing, too, we want to keep in mind is that one of the things that allows for Giotto to create such naturalist paintings is that he actually observed people. He looked at them and tried to record what he saw rather than just imagining the scenes. And so like, for example, this idea of like people positioned in certain ways. I love this woman who's like in the process of taking off her, her coat, right? Or her garment. That's very unorthodox. We wouldn't typically see something. It's the same idea as like in the Kiss of Judas, seeing that guy from, from behind. And again, this idea of observation is an artistic process. This will prove to be highly influential in the Renaissance. <clears throat> Let's look at one more. Oh, Lamentation. I love this one, okay? This is the one with the, uh, the emotions, right? Where you have uh, Jesus, he's been crucified, martyred, he's taken off from the cross. In Lamentation, the people gather around him, they lament his death. If there is any time to create an emotional painting, this is it. And look at it, all these different emotions of people handling grief in different ways, right? Really a testament to their individuality. We all handle sadness and grief differently. You know, some people are gesturing. This lady like has her hands to her face. Look at these angels, right? Not in this one, but in his crucifixion, there's like an angel that's like so upset. It's like ripping its clothes open. So epic, right? Again, different positions, people with their backs to us, different like profile positions. You've got this great wall that's here that is like kind of separating the foreground from the background. It creates an implied line that leads us to Jesus. We've got this very sort of deliberate, rational construction of the composition. Um, that's going to factor in big time in the Renaissance, and no one is doing that yet. So again, what is the takeaway here? Giotto is doing things that have not been done before in the history of art, but will be done all the time when we get to the Renaissance. Ergo, Giotto single-handedly is ushering in the Renaissance, the entire rebirth of art.